Hi everyone, welcome. We're gonna get started right on time. My name is Claire Bilski and I'm the Director of Client Services at WMFDP. Please note that we'll be using the Q&A feature today. If you have any questions that you'd like our panel to discuss, please submit them through Q&A. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jim Morris. Thanks, Claire. Welcome everyone to this super important conversation about managing uncomfortable conversations across race. I want to start off by just challenging the name that we gave this session, Managing Uncomfortable Conversations Around Race, which sounds like what we're saying is let's make it nice and tidy and let's make it comfortable and let's, let's make sure that the people that actually have the most work to do on this don't feel attacked. And that's not at all what we meant by naming it Managing Uncomfortable Conversations. The real opportunity here is to learn to manage ourselves in having the courage and the competence to step into uncomfortable conversations with people across race to really understand more about what's going on, particularly now, particularly today, particularly with the loss and death and murders that have happened in the United States, not this year, not last year, but consistently over an extended period of time to men and women of color, particularly black men and women at the hands of the police. So we wanna examine this topic um, openly and honestly, and that, which means sometimes it's gonna be messy. We're very appreciative of having our panelists our, our join us today for the conversation. And also wanna really thank the Center for Talent Innovation for agreeing to partner with us in this important conversation. Now a few words just about context and about our firm. Um, White Men is Full Diversity Partners is an organization that does exactly what that name implies. We're about trying to help um, white men engage white men in, in work and organizations help become part of the diversity and inclusion and equity conversation in their organizations instead of feeling like our job is to sit on the sidelines and waiting to be told what to do. We would argue that one of the reasons we're not able to drive more systemic change has to do with the fact that Sometimes white men, we would argue, and white women um, are not fully invested or not able to participate in the way that they might be able to, to contribute to the conversation in whole. I wanna also say, and this is maybe for some of you pr pr provocative, but racism in our opinion is a condition that is uh, pernicious and systemic and fundamental and needs to be addressed by white people. Um, we're, we really need to work on it together. We've got to be willing to take the topic on with our men and women uh, colleagues of color who have been for decades, centuries even, been managing it without necessarily having our support. So there's a real desire and need for all of us to be part of finding solutions to dismantle racism, at, at, a, at a core level, and we're going to talk about it today in terms of having those conversations, having those uncomfortable conversations across difference at work. So again, race, racism is a condition of racial inequity that was created largely by white people. And it's our work to shift it, even though our colleagues have been working on it for a long, long, long time. So as we step into the conversations today, I want to give a couple of ground rules just for things to think about in terms of how we approach it. One is try and always speak from your own experience. Speak from your heart, speak for what's true for you, even if it means you have to say, I don't understand or I don't know. Try and go beyond the data. Having a conversation about data and who knows the most about what's happened um, sometimes takes us away from talking about what we're noticing about impact. Talking about impacts is that sometimes a conversation that can be hard to hear, but very important, particularly for um, white people. Set boundaries around what you will and won't talk about. If you don't understand something, be willing to say it. If you're uncomfortable or feel unsafe talking about it, feel free to learn to say that as well. And finally, and this is really important for our conversation today, emotions are really welcomed. Bring your emotions. There's a historical precedent for white people saying, you know, you can tell me what you think, person of color, black person, whoever you are, you can tell me what you think, but please don't make me uncomfortable. Please don't show too much emotion. Please don't get angry. Please don't express your true emotions because I can't take that. So keep it in a nice tight little bundle. 
so that I feel comfortable as you talk about it. Of course, we don't want to be in a conversation where people are attacking each other. But for me to really be an ally, one of the things I'm continuing to learn as a white guy is I've got to be willing to stand in the fire and receive your emotions, even if they're difficult, even if they're loud, even if they're uncomfortable. So today, emotions are allowed for all of us. This is an emotional time. There's lots going on. We want to make room for that. So with that, I want to also um, offer one more disclaimer, and that's that the panelists want to make sure you understand that what you're going to hear from them is what their experience on these topics are. They're not necessarily the top of the, the positions or values represented by their firms. You're hearing from these, as, these people as individuals who are also leaders and members of different organizations in the United States. So, yeah, I think that's all the stuff I was going to cover on the front end, except now to introduce uh, Linnea Urban, who's the president of the, of the Center for Talent Innovation. Uh, it's a diversity and inclusion think tank that drives groundbreaking research in this space to help organizations leverage the full partnership, the full potential of their diverse workforces. Linnea, thank you. Hi, Linnea, I think you're on mute. Yep. Mute now. There you go. Great. Um, are you able to hear me? Yes. Well, thank you, Jim. Uh, and uh, uh, the CTI team is delighted to join uh, this unscripted conversation. Uh, we, we, we find ourselves, uh, you know, in a moment of a tremendous pain uh, and complexity in this country. A moment defined by collective grief and disappointment and, and conversations like these uh, give us an opportunity for education, uh, for some powerful storytelling, storytelling that changes hearts and minds perhaps. Um, and at CTI we know that these conversations in the workplace help an organization to awaken to bias, help organizations to move towards more active allyship and a greater sense of belonging for everyone. And at the Center for Talent Innovation, our research reveals that entrenched bias and racism continues to create barriers to success in the work environment. And so we know it's important to let the, the, the outside world in. For some, success and advancement, you know, aren't necessarily aligned with ambition. Uh, black professionals, for example, for example, are four times as likely to feel that black talent has to work harder to advance. Majority, 58% of black professionals report having experienced racial prejudice at work, meaning the workplace is not a safe haven from systemic racism that permeates the rest of society. When you think of what's going on today. Professionals of color are less likely to have visibility and access to senior executive advocates. And not only are black respondents less likely to have access uh, to leaders. Our research shows, uh, for example, that Asian professionals, 15% say that not a single senior leader knows them by name. So people are bringing trauma into the workplace on the back of uh, protests and, and, and social unrest, COVID-19. But for far too long, these same communities have too been rendered invisible in connection to power in the workplace. So it's important for each of us and for leaders to offer space for dialogue, uh, you know, commit to emotion, as Jim said, commit to human, human connection, ensuring people have an opportunity to be seen and heard. And for allies, it's important to listen, be active in your allyship, demonstrate some awareness of disproportionate impact. And, uh, you know, Jim also mentioned, finding a way to sit in that discomfort, acknowledging what you don't know. Because we, we, we feel, uh, many of us feel, that it's better for you to show up with perhaps some flaws than to not show up at all. And until 
this country fully reckons, you know, it's not until this country fully reckons with the realities of racism that any of us will have a chance to heal, a chance to move beyond this moment in time. Um, and I know that we would like, uh, you know, to see this country come together, perhaps even without some of these challenging conversations, but ending, ending racism will require each of us to take ownership uh, and to be a part of dialogue that in some type and in some instances, uh, some instances um, is unsettling and uh, uh, does bring us some discomfort. So with that, uh, you know, Jim, I'll, I'll turn things over to you to uh, kick us off. And thank you again. Thanks so much, Linnea, and thank you again to you and the Center for Talent Innovation to agreeing to co-host this with us. So appreciated. Such an important topic. I would like, would like our panelists to please introduce themselves for the audience. Hi, my name is Christina Francisco McGuire, and I'm a Senior Engagement Manager at CTI, where I lead a lot of our client work on how to create inclusive uh, cultures at their organizations. Hi, my name is Emily A. Yu, and I'm a senior research associate at CTI. Uh, I do data analysis, mostly on the research side, and help shape our research reports. Good afternoon. I'm Adam Kuntz. I'm the director of bioethics and advanced care planning for Novant Health. Uh, we're, we're a client of Jim and, and W. White Men's Full Diversity Partners. Uh, and I also co-chair our Engaging White Men's Business Resource Group. And my name is Kevin Edwards. I'm the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Bechtel Corporation. Um, we too have been partnering with uh, WMFDP um, on the Courageous Leadership Workshops as well and um, advancing relative to our DNI efforts at Bechtel. Thank you so much, all of you, for agreeing to be part of this. I mean, I can't believe you did it because it was like, would you like to join a conversation that we're not actually going to prepare for? Because we, we, and we really haven't. I mean, we've run through kind of who's going to say what at the beginning. But what you're about to hear, everyone, is really unscripted. Um, and we're going to continue to monitor and look at the questions that come up. And we will we'll have access to them. And we might be able to pick one up and address it as our time goes on. I want to say one more thing before we get started. We noticed a pattern in the questions that people sent in ahead of time where there was kind of, I would class them as at least two different categories. One were questions that were saying, um, how do I do this? And I'm gonna guess that a fair number of those questions were driven by white folks, because it was questions like, how do I talk about Black Lives Matter? How do I have a conversation with a, a person that's black that I've never talked to before that's in my office and I wanna see how they're doing? How do I, so I'm gonna guess those questions were from people that really want some information and they're hoping this session will give them a how-to step-by-step on what to do. Unfortunately for you, that's not what we're going we're gonna to do. And actually, we would say that's not what actually you need from us. Um, the goal here isn't to figure out a nice and tidy way to talk about some of these difficult conversations so that you don't misstep. If you do this work a lot, as I, as I have been doing, you're actually going to find out you'll misstep more. But you've got to be willing to misstep more with the right intention to bring your heart and your care to the conversation. So we're gonna spend less time on talking about how to and more to about how we be. So instead of thinking about what we do, more thinking about what are the mindsets that drive our fears around this conversation? What are our mindsets or um, our concerns about what might happen if we have a difficult conversation? Are we afraid of rejection? Are we afraid of being criticized? Are we afraid of being told we are a racist? You know, what are we? What are our fears, and how do we overcome some of those fears so that we can courageously step into these conversations in ways that create better partnerships? So, panelists, to open up, and whoever wants to go, great. I'd love to hear from all of you to the degree that you're able. Um, if you will, you heard me talk about. You know, sometimes we go about this. We say, let's have a conversation, but let's not have it get too spicy. Let's not have it get to be too heated. Please stay calm. Please make sure you deliver it in a way that I can understand. I'm curious, what would you, what's the answer to the question about what's been the cost um, on you of not being able to talk in an unscripted way about your experience with regard to race? So Jim, I'm happy to start. Um, so 
I'll be honest, I don't think I felt comfortable talking about race for the first 25, 30 years of my life. Um, I grew up in a Filipino household in an incredibly white neighborhood where my parents' accents were mocked and I saw hate crimes being committed around me. Like I remember when I was probably like six, there was a household of Asian descent, like a neighbor that we knew very well. And their house was defaced with Nazi graffiti and there were swastikas all over the place. I remember thinking as a six-year-old, wow, I, I thought Nazis, I didn't think the target of their ire was South Asians. And like what I took away from that was that hate was really random and that if you stick out, then you'll be targeted. And so I think I spent most of my life like minimizing difference and trying to pretend that, you know, I, I was the same as everyone else. Um, but, you know, doing that is exhausting. And I don't think I felt, I, I didn't think I br brought my full self to work or to anywhere really um, until much later in life, until, you know, I started really hanging out with people who were very vocal about their diverse identities and were, you know, speaking openly about immigrant backgrounds, about communities of color that were very similar to what I grew up in. And so I think I had to see people really model pride in their identity and openness about it before I felt comfortable enough to do it myself. And so I really empathize with anyone on the call who feels like they are uncomfortable talking about race at work because I've definitely been there and not just at work but in my life um, but now that you know I sort of do this work for a living lately what I've been thinking about is how I support you know my black friends my black colleagues and what I am so embarrassed about is that I checked in way too late after everything going on with Brianna with George Floyd with you know with Ahmad like I just you know I think that part of me is still trying to understand where I fall in a conversation that has often been framed as a black and white conversation. And sometimes I, I try to fall back on, you know, this idea that I'm a woman of color who's doing this work and, you know, hopefully the people around me know that I support them, but that's not the case and I have to be more explicit. And I think that despite being in diversity and inclusion, despite feeling like I had done all this reflection and all this work on myself, post Trayvon Martin, post Tamir Rice, post all of these all of these incidents of injustice in the world, you know, I still checked in too late. And so I obviously, you know, I'm still working on myself. I'm still on a journey. Um, and it's, you know, but I understand that I need to do this work because otherwise there is a toll on my relationship. Great. Thanks. So that is the cost to me. That's what I've been thinking about. Yeah, Jim, I'd like to add something too. And uh, Christina, I can definitely resonate with the uh, your perspectives. Um, you know, I will tell you as, as being in the DNI space for the last uh, two and a half years, um, to me, I thought it was a requirement for me to be comfortable right out of the gates to talk about race, right? That was what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to get my organization comfortable to have those uncomfortable conversations. And then I didn't realize how uh, much of a newbie I was until I still started working with WMFDP and really getting me to, to get to a point where I can be so comfortable and allow people, even though they were uncomfortable, to be comfortable. Now, I, you know, I, I take a few steps back because, you know, I'm born in the 60s and being a biracial um, person, dad being white and mom being black, I, I lived and grew up in a, um, a black neighborhood. But I, I actually had, um, I actually had um, issues with my community because um, the black community didn't really accept me because I was actually appeared to be white. Um, and, 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 and in the 60s, um, where does a biracial relationship in a biracial child come from? Um, and so here I'm thinking I've got a community that's going to accept me because I'm in the dominant group and, and I'm in a black neighborhood. But in fact, uh, they looked at me differently. Um, and so th there was always challenges that I had relative to that. So not that I was fearful of having the discussion about race, but then now I was being challenged um, relative to you really aren't who you are, even though you really identify as someone being black. So um, it, it has been a, 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 um, a path. Um, that has um, um, taken different um, 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 uh, paths along the way. If we think about uh, streets and going down avenues and highways, there's been a lot of turns that I've had to make to make adjustments to continue going down a path that I thought was uh, um, um, equal from a standpoint of having um, 
the confidence to continue as the person that I knew I was as a black man. Thank, thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's really remarkable how resonant these parts of our stories are to, to me, like Christina and Kevin. Mm -hmm. uh, because Christina, similar to you, I didn't feel very comfortable talking about race or even recognizing myself as uh, someone who was not white just because I didn't know where I fit and I didn't want to be seen as different. Uh, and neither, you know, neither did my family. My parents didn't want me to actively go out and, you know, notice all of these things that were inconsistent. They wanted me to feel like I was just like anyone else. And it wasn't really until I got to college, I, you know, even, even until I started my first job that I really um, was able to look back and understand that I, I had had all these differentiated experiences. I did not grow up the same way as uh, someone of another race. I did not grow up the same way as uh, a lot of people that you see on TV or, or a lot of famous people. I, I, didn't, I just didn't have those experiences. And I think it took a long time and it is something that's still happening to, to unlearn some of those habits of, um, you know, kind of, I, I felt like I gave, I, I grew up in a mostly white neighborhood and I feel like I gave a lot of those people just a pretty consistent pass for any kind of microaggression because I figured, you know, they're not trying to be ignorant. Uh, they're not trying to be hurtful. They are well-intentioned. And so because they're not aware, they don't have the skills, the experience or what, whatever you might call it. I felt like I just had to kind of take that and just say, you know, if somebody, if a friend of mine who is also a kid asks me something like, hey, is it true that like, that you eat dog? Uh, have you ever eaten hamsters? Like that, that happened a lot. <laughs> Um, and that's, that's like one of many different kinds of stereotypes that I faced. Uh, I actively did not get offended. I would just say like, oh, okay, like why don't, I, I took it upon myself as a child to say, let me, let me turn this into a teaching moment for you. And to explain that like, no, I never have, and I don't know anyone who has, and I actually don't think it's that common. Um, and I didn't realize until much later that that was something that I shouldn't have had to do. Um, and I think I would react differently now, but it's, it's tough because it's, Great. it's ingrained in you. Yeah. Thanks for that. Very much for the honest share about that. Emilia. Adam. Yeah, Jim, and, and thanks to, to my colleagues on the panel for, for speaking up and, and sharing their life experiences with me. You know, w when I think about this question, Jim, that you asked, what, what's the cost and to me? I kept circling back to the first thing I have to acknowledge is that um, the cost for me is is a whole lot less than the other three people on this panel. If I'm if through, through one perspective, I'm real about it. Uh, Emilia talked about the shared experience for the three of them, and that's not a shared experience that I can sit here and talk about. Uh, I, I grew up as a white male in rural North Carolina. Uh, I, if I think back to my elementary school, kindergarten to fifth grade, I remember three people who weren't white. That, that went to school with me growing up. And so the, the cost, if I look back now, because of having conversations with people in, in, in my organization and, and out and through college, I think the cost for me was missing out on aspects of other people growing up because there wasn't any conversation. Um, it was potentially having people that could have or should have been friends who may have distanced from me because we wouldn't talk about the things that the other panelists have mentioned or, or talked about. Uh, and, and I think not talking about race um, has certainly created unspoken tension, you know, throughout the years, either between other friends um, or even family members, uh, where the wedge of not talking about this just gradually, you know, it was easier to distance and not talk about it if we weren't willing to talk about it. And um, that may have had a significant cost. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. Thanks. So um, all the panelists like me are looking at the um, questions coming in. And um, 
from the from the audience. Any anyone that want to take one on, want to answer one, or at least address one. Maybe not answer, but at least talk about one. <clears throat> So I see a question about how to find areas of tension in the workplace and relieve them before they come, they become detrimental. Um, you know, CTI, we work with a lot of different clients on, on um, how they can uncover um, the different problems in the workplace and the challenges that face their different diverse talent. I know a lot of uh, companies that we work with use em employee engagement surveys and try to really understand the pain points that way. Um, I think that you can um, ask about, you know, you can ask about microaggressions at work, or, uh, you know, or you can ask about their experience of leadership, their experience with, um, you know, sort of uh, different processes in the workplace and try to see where tensions may arise from uh, the organization itself. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, Jim, there was something, um, a question relative to, um, what drives racism, fear, or hatred, um, which I think it, it is an amazing um, question. And in fact, today I, I got a text from a friend of mine about something very related. Um, it, it's both, honestly. Um, and, and I was talking to one of my senior leaders today about the learned behavior, the learned behavior of racism. Um, and I will share something in college. Um, I remember specifically, I was in a fraternity, a, a mixed race fraternity, primarily more white than any other races. Um, and I remember one particular day being in a car with four of my other fraternity brothers and we're driving. And I remember one of my fraternity brothers who was white um, say out loud, I wish that nigger would move his car. And I had, I have spent numerous amount of times with him and his family on several uh, occasions, different dinners. And I have never, I had never experienced any of that in their family. I had any indication that that was a thought process that they had. And that we had some uh, uh, discussions while we were in a car about it. Um, and it, it all turned out and, and it dawned on me that was something that he learned growing up. It was something that he adopted as part of his behavior based on what he saw or learn through his growing up. Now, as an opposite, there's a big piece of fear because of whatever particular reason, even you've experienced something or someone else close to you has experienced something. In fact, today, a colleague of mine was walking in Delaware along the beach and there was a black man who was looking for some directions or something. And my friend who is white said to me, she noticed at least five individuals on the street ignore this man as he's reaching out for some simple directions. And she took it upon herself to help and guide this man, but she was appalled by how everyone else was so, it appeared, fearful mm -hmm. to really approach the man, number one. Maybe there's a COVID-19 piece about it, but I think obviously it's greater than that. But there was also a bigger piece in regards to a fear of can I trust having um, an engagement or interaction with the individual? Thanks, Kevin. What else are you seeing or hear in the, in the questions panelists that you'd like to talk about? Great questions from the audience, incidentally. Keep them coming. Questions and comments. Hey, Jim, I'm just looking at the q and I see a question um, that says, as a white male, how do I take the lead in starting the uncomfortable conversation so I can learn and understand their view and experience? Um, and, and I'll preface by saying, I, I don't know that I have the right answer, um, but I can tell you what my answer has been, you know, around that and, and what I've heard, you know, from others. And so um, if for me, it's, it's, we, we have a value in our organization of practicing with a questioning attitude. Um, and so for me, it's, it's listening, it's asking, it's opening up. Uh, I, it really involves true listening. I, I think I always think back to the Mark Nepo quote, um, to, to truly listen is to, to lean in with a willingness to be changed by what you hear. Um, and so I think um, people who are not a white male, uh, what I typically experience is that they voice to me, I would rather you um, come to me and ask the wrong question, but at least show that you're interested in hearing something from me 
then sit in silence on the other side of the room trying to find the right question to ask. And so I think most of the time, if your intentions are right, then the wording can be worked on and, and you know, they, they, can, they can share their thoughts or feelings. But I'd open up to, to other panelists if they have any other thoughts around that. Um, yeah, that's a great question. That's a good comment, Adam. I appreciate it. And I, I want to hear from the panelists too, in case you have anything to say. But one of the things I notice, Adam, that's a pattern in our group as white guys is we want to do it right, right? And particularly at work, we want to do it right because there's right and wrong. And so doing it right means having it all go well. And so as a result of our desire to do it right, we sometimes don't do anything because we're not sure what right looks like. So I notice a lot of us are fro frozen in inaction because we don't want to get messy with it and we don't know what will happen and we can't predict the outcome because we don't actually understand the topic sometimes. So instead of even trying or stepping into it, we just don't. Others? Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, you know, I, uh, I think, I think people are much stronger than they tend to feel that they are. And, and to me, I mean, I'm sensitive in regards to having the comfort to step out. But I think, um, but it, you know, I, I really think it's a cop out in a lot of ways too, Jim. Um, you know, I, I really feel that we all have um, a responsibility to learn and grow, right, in a lot of ways. Um, and in order to really do that, and maybe this is just something I've always had to, had to do in my life um, as a black male or a person of color, um, it, I, it, nothing was ever given to me. I've had to work 10 times harder than anyone else to get what I needed. Um, and if, and if I ever showed that I wasn't proactive or I couldn't lean in or I couldn't take initiative, that was a negative perception for me. And so I think the a tendency to stand back, particularly in the, in the tough conversations, um, is a cop out. I think. I think it, the best piece that generally people want to see is you're taking some initiative to want to learn, or some initiative to get some insight, or some initiative to grow. And I will tell you, based on the work we started doing with you in WMFDP in, in 2019, and we're continuing in 2020, I, I'm impressed by when our colleagues are put in a position that they have to stand and lean in they typically go and do it. And maybe it's the position that we're putting them in to force them to do that. Great, thanks, Kevin. I'm sorry, I'm not sure if we're still on this topic, but I, I saw quite a few questions come in about um, microaggressions and unconscious bias and maybe how to respond to that or just to hear about experiences. Um, to start with, the, the question that I saw specifically was about uh, how to respond to this microaggression as, as a brown person who is called by uh, another South Asian woman's name. It's not my experience of reading from the question. Um, I am not South Asian, but I can relate to this because I have also been called the name of any other mildly Asian looking person in the vicinity. This happened to me basically from first grade to 12th grade and then also in college. <laughs> um, and occasionally at work, but it's, it's a lot better because my workplace is a lot better <laughs> than, um, than the spaces I was in before. I, I wish I had like a perfect solution, but I, I don't other than just to say it clearly every time. Um, if correct them every time if you have the energy. Um, for me, things were difficult because my name is not a typical name and it's not something that people automatically know how to pronounce. It looks like it's pronounced Amelia, but it's actually pronounced Emilia. <laughs> and um, so I make sure that I say that as clearly as possible, just to make sure that they don't have an excuse of like, I didn't hear you when you said that. And then if they, you know, kind of mistake it again, I just kind of without emotion, without anything, I just say, this is my name. Or, you know, maybe even say, like, I think you're thinking of this other person. Most people will 
you know, be embarrassed and feel a little racist. And I think that um, in that moment, I, I don't do anything to comfort them because that's kind of, I've learned over time that that's not, that's not my problem. Um, I'm not like offended. I don't, I don't like now dislike that person because it's an honest mistake. But for them to sit in that discomfort for a second and maybe like think about it a little bit later in a broader context, I think that's, that's a good growth moment. And I don't think we should shy away from that. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Um, if anyone else wants to weigh in. I can also add to what Emily is, Emilia is saying. Um, I know that a, a lot of times I'll just say something like, I don't think you meant it. You know, I don't think you meant for that to come off in that way. Or I, I don't think we're supposed to say that. Or, I, you know, something that that really acknowledges that, you know, I, I am calling them out. But also, in a way, as Emilia mentioned, that is calm, that is sort of a little bit more detached so that we can continue talking about it. Right, and I just want to say I know I want to again notice you're proving it's a proof of concept here, right? I, I was talking about we always have to say things calmly, so that we don't spark defensiveness and reaction and stuff. Um, and it, it's great that you do that. Totally understand. In work, we all have to do that to one degree or another. But I'm always I'm just shocked at how much effort I hear my colleagues who are men and women of color have to put into making sure it's all going to be okay. Thanks. Thank you. Interesting you say that because there's a, there was a question that I wanted to chime in on. I, I'd like to get Adam's feedback as well. Not that I'm putting you on the spot, my friend, but um, I think you can weigh in on something relative to this. But it was a question about how do you repair a, re a relationship with a person of color, particularly maybe when you sidestepped and done something, said something that was taken the wrong way. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, for the most part, um, you, you know, we, we want to give everybody the, um, uh, the opportunity to advance and grow. Um, um, and, and if we, and if we kind of um, understand that um, we all are allowed to make a mistake, one thing I've learned in this DNI space is um, um, you will make a lot of mistakes. We all will make a lot of mistakes. We will stumble. Um, and um, part of that whole path or stumbling um, allows you to grow and become better um, and become one a better listener and a better person to have a dialogue um, and and as long as the individual has some good intentions and wants to learn and then can use it as a learning moment for themselves whereas when they can see someone else doing it and they take it upon themselves to, to create a learning environment for the other person I think that really shows um, truly where their passion and how they have the ability to really kind of change, change uh, what, how they think and their whole mindset. And I think that, that there's power in that. Um, and so I think we always have to um, um, be mindful of giving, giving those who stumble a second chance um, and educate and make them aware and allow them to have the opportunity to successfully adopt and hold themselves accountable and then hold others. So I, I interested to see what your thoughts are. Maybe, maybe Adam, you have stumbled or maybe you've seen people stumble. Interested to see what you think. Yeah. Th thanks, Kevin. I appreciate that. I, I think when I think about that, about the missteps, the, the first thought I have is it, it throws me back a minute to that question you had about fear or hate. Um, and, and I think for me, I have to recognize um, th that perhaps there's a third option and that's just complete naivety. Or, or ignorance, you know, that I, I grew up, I spent 25 years growing up in a world where I would not have been exposed <laughs> to anyone um, the, the first 18 years of my life, really, that that looked like the three of you on the panel with me. And so I, I had no exposure to base it on. So the things that I misstepped on weren't, probably weren't driven out of fear or hatred, um, but, but just ignorance, perhaps. Um, so I, I would hope I hope others, you know, could offer grace when I'm able to acknowledge that when I misstep. So I think when I misstep one, as soon as I recognize that I misstepped, I have to acknowledge that I misstep. You know, and and so I think that's I think that's important. Um, and, and I think another piece that I have to own when I think about that, Kevin, is that um, while I will look at that situation and say, "Gosh, you know." Kevin, I hope you'll just give me a break. This is the one time in five years that I misstepped, you know, and said something that I didn't mean to. 
And I have to acknowledge that that's probably the fifth time uh, that day that someone has misstepped directed towards you. And so the, the tolerance for forgiveness um, I, would have to be awfully plenty, I think, for, for every, everyone who's not like me to forgive everyone who misstepped around them. And so um, I, I think it takes time. And I think to your point, the, the intention is what matters. And so I think if both people can come back to the table and find the point of, of the, the shared pool of meaning, what do we both hope to accomplish in this? Let's move past the one behavior and, and move forward towards the long-term goal. Yeah, I, I want to just say, um, I think, Emilia, you had a response to something, to a, to a question, but Adam, I wanted to say, and to the audience, there were a number of questions that came up on the feed about um, white fragility. So part of what Adam was just addressing was this topic of white fragility and how we deal with it. Um, and the notion that, you know, when we try something and it doesn't work, then we like, well, I've tried, you know, I tried being, I tried talking to diverse people and I wasn't successful. So I quit. I stopped. I'm done. You know, they, they weren't able to handle it. So, you know, we've got to, we've got to be more sturdy and find a way to get past that, which is hard and takes courage. Emilia, you had, you had a question that you thought was uh, yeah, I'm curious if anyone else wants to weigh in on this as well, but there was um, a question from a Black woman who asked about kind of how to balance your, your self-care uh, and, and managing people's perceptions of you um, with regards to these types of conversations about race. So like you want to be involved in the conversation, you want to be there on the ground helping co-create solutions, you know, maybe at your workplace and other spheres of life, but as we've acknowledged, it's really exhausting work and it's very easy to burn out and be overwhelmed. Um, I think that, you know, someone's per like particular response to this or solution to this is going to be really, really different based on who you are as an individual. And then I also think there, it's very different for different people of colors. But for me, just from my experience, um, I definitely struggle with this because I, um, I find myself, uh, I find it difficult sometimes to resist the pull of trying to get as much information as possible, trying to read as many opinions as possible, even if those opinions aren't necessarily well vetted ones. Because mm -hmm. to me, I, I, if I hear about something scary, I want to know how can I protect myself from this? How can I help other people protect themselves from this? And I have to like, gather as much data as possible. So how can I get a, like a really clear picture of what every single person in the country thinks about this? Uh, unfortunately, that is impossible. And the only thing that I really um, accomplish in getting sucked into that kind of vortex, whether it's a social media vortex or a news one or, you know, calling up all my friends <laughs> in the middle of the night, uh, is that I just get really exhausted and then I can't function at all. I can't take care of myself and I can't, I definitely can't help co-create any kind of solution. So I do think that that self-care is really important, but it is difficult because if people see you and especially if you're a person of color, they expect you to feel a certain way about it or to be doing something about it. Um, they expect you, us, to take action and, and put out all of these solutions and well-researched policy steps. Uh, and there are people who are doing that, but it, it's not every single one of our responsibilities to, mm -hmm. to do that, yeah. especially for our friends and family. Yeah, it's a great question and I appreciate your response. Thank you. Others, what else are you seeing everyone? You know, I see, uh, few comments in the Q&A about how do you begin having conversations about race at work if you've never done it before, you know, like, where do you even begin? Um, you know, I think that what helped for me to bring, start talk, talking about race at work was seeing other people start to do it and seeing other people feel comfortable with it and, um, you know, just making it part of everyday conversation. And I think that, you know, if you are reflecting on how race has impacted your life and you know um being white like that is a race and like how has being white um impacted your life and if you can bring stories like that to work but you know not make it like a conversation about race if you can you know 
interject it into the conversation, like where it makes sense. And so that your thread on race is ongoing. Um, to me, that, that feels like a, a good start to a conversation. And that's sort of how I came into conversations on race. Mm, thanks, thanks. What else are you noticing or seeing in the feed, panelists? Yeah, I mean, I think it's something I saw, and maybe Christina was kind of linking to this in regards to, you know, are we are we really not hitting on the key piece that's tied to this, which is, you know, first of all, in the DNI space, the thing I try to make sure my organization um, always keeps in mind is this isn't a zero sum game, right? Um, and you know we all should, I don't know if we all need to go back and reflect on, hey, the struggles we had, but that's a pretty significant thing from a history standpoint in regards to why Blacks and African Americans sit where they sit in the world today and the struggles we had and the inequalities. Um, I think there are, there is some fear out there um, as people of color, and uh, minorities start advancing and begin to um, receive the opportunities that they have so deserved for so long. Of course, there's fear of uh, replacement. Um, but the thing that we try to make sure we put a focus on always, which of course um, you have to continue to defend, is there is no question that people of color, male and female, minorities, are just as qualified as any of their white counterparts. And if we can finally look at it from an equality standpoint and allow there to be um, a truly um, fair process for this, I think at some point we'll turn the corner. But I, but, I, but I think history has played a significant part in regards to why this is so fragile and why um, you know, the struggle for a lot in, in many multiculturals as well as for our white colleagues um, is hard um, and it's going to be a challenge. And this also, you know, I think that um, in terms of what CTI has seen in the work, you know, we're always saying that tone from the top really matters and that, you know, leadership, uh, you know, it really helps for leaders to take a public with their employees about race and to really um, issue statements to really hold those town halls when you know in, when people like George Floyd are killed and people are thinking about it and so I think that in terms of you know the the dynamics of how um, someone is who's bringing this up at work and who's trying to create those ongoing threads on race for people to ruminate on and people to, you know, for people to see as a signal to discuss race at work. Um, I do think that leaders have more responsibility there and that, you know, um, leader, to be a leader is really to show leadership on these hard issues and mm -hmm. to really be that voice in the room who is bringing up the hard questions. Um, so that's all I would, I would add to that. No, oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there was a question on our feed. We're going to, we're coming up uh, we, we don't have a lot of time left, but there was one question in our feed, Adam. I, I'd love for you and I to talk about this for a moment. Um, and also for the, all the panelists, I don't mean to be exclusive about that, just to talk about it, because maybe you all have seen it too. It's a question about one of the common tactics employed by predominantly white folks who are intent on undermining Black Lives Matter movement is to dig up video of an African American who aligns to their perspective. Um, uh, one popular person's gaining a lot of traction in these circles and she's uh, bringing in a bunch of skewed data and it's hard to com compete with someone who has made it their full-time job to dig up skewed statistics and studies that make their point. Adam, I don't know if you've seen that, but um, uh, I, I notice it a lot with white guys. Like we love data, right? And it's like, give me, so we end up in arguments about who's got the most accurate data about what's happening. Like you know, there were, there were looters involved in the, you know, one of the protests. And so all of a sudden the, the one storefront that's on fire in a hundred thousand person protest that was started probably by five or six people gets the press versus the hundred thousand peaceful protesters who showed up 
what do you what do you do when people start to try and null? I, I believe what's happening, Adam and, and panelists. I'd love to hear what you think. I believe what's happening there is people are unconsciously trying to nullify the good work that's happening to say, well, it's not all good work. You know, it's like, yeah, I don't know. What do you what do you where are you at with that, Adam? Yeah, Jim. I think um, in some ways, I think it, it circles back a little bit to some of what Kevin was saying about. The, the foundation of racism in our society. Um, and I think it circles back to the, the conversation about um, white fragility or, or white privilege. And I just, first let me say it, white fragility, when, it, when I hear that and think about that, and I, I'm familiar with the concept, I certainly understand the concept and have seen it at play all around me. Um, and certainly as Jim speaks to in his sessions, rugged individualism is one of the defining characteristics of white male culture. And so the word fragility is directly in opposition to that um, and seems threatening and offensive kind of out of the gates. And so what are you, um, I'm not fragile. You're calling me fragile. While I think it resonates well with people that are already on the wagon, uh, I'm not sure it's going to get <laughs> other people to get on board um, if that's the kind of language. So I think, you know, we have to have to find other ways to speak to that while still understanding the concepts and principles that underlie that are that are in there. Um, to your point about undermining Black Lives Matter or those efforts, I mean, I think you're right. It's, it's fear or hate, right? The same two things that we talked about earlier. Either I'm afraid of what I'm going to lose, you know, when this does start to gain traction and Black Lives Matter start improving, um, or I just don't like those people and I want to undermine any effort to, to change their lives. And so um, any, any one example, in, in therapy, I'm a licensed counselor by training, so in therapy we call this the binocular effect. Um, the, the things that I like that amplify my point, I look at through binoculars the way you're supposed to look through binoculars. Um, and the things that I don't like that would counter my point, I spin the binoculars around and shrink that down to where it's almost invisible. Uh, and so it's really easy for any of us to do that with points that we strongly believe in or hold passionately or have held for a long time, um, whether we do that consciously or unconsciously. And so I think that's part of what's at play. Christina and Emilia, you, you work in data. You work for an organization that gets data and talks about what its impl implications are on society and the workplace and people. So what do you do when people use data to kind of nullify change or nullify empathy or nullify the, a real experience for people? Um, Christina, do you, do you mind if I, if I take this? That's um, great. <laughs> so yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, the, the, the kind of, um, the kind of white male archetype you're referring to who comes in armed with data, maybe they say something like facts don't care about your feelings. Um, I'm, I'm very familiar with that, unfortunately. Uh, I don't know that there's a perfect response to that because I think that for, a, a, I think in some cases, the, the person who's coming in armed with all that data is susceptible to that binocular effect that you were talking about, Adam, because data is it's very, very easy to manipulate statistics and to grab sources that are not uh, as credible as they should be. And it's very easy to not look deeper than the first couple of layers because Unfortunately, it just takes a ton of work. It's a ton of time that you have to invest in uh, pulling out some kind of true or accurate statement. Um, so I, I would say that it's, you know, you can, you can try to fight back with more data by, uh, or you can try to fact check them, but that's not always something that you can do right in that moment, which is very frustrating. Um, so I don't know exactly what my response is, but yeah, I mean, um, yeah, and then we're in a then we're in a debate about the data versus a discussion about what's happening in the world and how we feel about it. And then yeah, I think maybe there it's more useful to try and zoom out and say like, okay, why is this the point that you're hung up on? This particular statistic. Um, what about? Well, I don't want to go into what aboutism, but it's worth asking. Why are you hung up on this point? Right. Uh, the conversation is in this place and you've decided to inhabit this space. Can we talk about why that is and what led you there and what particular 
fear you are experiencing that's leading you to this right. place that nobody, that other people are maybe not talking about. Yeah, great, thank you. Adam, you were going to offer something, I think. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just say that, you know, we, we see this sometimes in healthcare when we're talking about serious illness. Uh, that healthcare professionals often are armed with data, right, and share data and are curious that um, while of that doesn't land or resonate with the patient that they're talking to. Um, and so maybe it's the therapist in me, but I, I certainly operate of the opinion that um, the heart has a tremendous ability to override the brain in, in, a, in a lot of cases. Our, our emotions can hijack us either for the positive or for the negative. And so many times I think um, the, the, the counter to data, it, I think to your point, Emily, you can use more data and, and probably 99% of the time that's not going to be effective because they'll look through your data through the binoculars the opposite way. Um, but story, power, emotion, sharing your personal experience, if anything's going to move someone, I, I think it, that's what it's going to be. Um, I, I'll also just add, you know, in, in the therapy world, we have, we have a joke that's how many therapists does it take to change a light bulb? none but the light bulb has to really want to change itself uh, the reality is if someone is locked in you know guns blazing with data to say i'm here to prove black lives matter wrong uh, then your time and your energy is probably better served somewhere else amen thank you thank you so we're coming up on the top of the hour which means our time is almost up um and i want to give the panelists or ask the panelists if you're willing to just kind of share your final thoughts in a second but I also want to mention that we'll be sending out tips and resources and answering more of your, your, your questions in a follow-up email. So we'll do our best to um, not only make this hour count, but also all the questions we weren't able to get to, or some of the questions we weren't able to get to, as well as some other resources in this time where this stuff is so needed. So I don't know who'd like to go first, but you know, again, what's, thanks for being here and being part of this. And, what would you like to leave the audience with in terms of thinking about uncomfortable conversations about race? Christina, you had your hand up. So um, I did see a question in the chat about, you know, are non-Black people of color looking at their community's anti-Blackness? And this is something that has been really on my mind lately. And, you know, as we think about um, the fact that we, I'm on a journey, like I'm trying to really um, understand how to, you know, impel my Asian community to action so that we could be showing solidarity with Black communities and really understanding that um, everyone, you know, when everyone is lifted up, we are all lifted up. And so um, I think that, you know, that that is my closing thought, just really um, trying to understand that, like, even if you're, a, if you have diverse identities, that there's always more that you can do, more that you can understand. Thank you. You know, Jim, I, um, I, I love these discussions. They really, you know, really open up the door for a lot of people to expand uh, their knowledge in regards to um, having a better way to work through the tough discussions. So for me, I'm, I'm all about it. One thing I will just share with everyone today, um, I, I had a discussion with uh, um, one of our black female executives and I say executive just because she is pretty senior. She's a retired Navy um, professional, a civilian, a senior executive in the Navy, retired, came to us, helping us. She's been with us for about eight months. And, you know, we just had our town hall yesterday and allowed uh, 17 of our colleagues to speak and really be open. And myself and, my C and our CEO led that, and it was great. It went 30 minutes longer than it was supposed to. It was scheduled for 90. We had two hours. And the thing that we talked about, one, you know, we're a company that, you know, several thousands of people, and yesterday we had a thousand people attend. And, you know, for some, you look at that as a negative, but I, I take it as a positive. And I, my focus wasn't necessarily on, wow, we didn't get thousands, we only got a thousand. The focus was on the energy there. The focus was the people that attended were advocates. We may have had some people that don't understand attend, yeah. but we do know there's a large portion of our population that are rejecting this. And so my opportunity is how do I uncover and get the individuals who are rejecting this to be comfortable in this space to talk and transition them in right. to being, maybe I don't understand and I want to understand more and then I become an advocate. That's what I'm looking at. 
to be able to help us become more inclusive in this in, the, in this uh, organization. Thanks, Kevin. Emily, you have a... Oh, I just wanted to um, kind of go off of some of those concepts, but especially what Christina said, I think she brought up a really good point about um, what, what you can do with the position that you're in with your specific identity. Uh, you know, I am Asian, there is anti-blackness in our community and it's very painful to have to acknowledge and to deal with, but it is necessary. And I, I have some hope that I see my peers in my generation really taking on this work without, without complaining, without patting an eye, uh, because it is, because we have a, a bit of shared empathy where we know that we would never want to be treated this way by other communities and we should not tolerate it in our own. It is, uh, it is a lifetime of work. Um, but if there's anyone <laughs> on our call right now who is, who is not convinced by that, who doesn't feel like, at least specifically for Asian individuals, who doesn't feel that, you know, we have a responsibility to do that or, you know, harbors any of those kinds of bigot bigoted feelings, um, again, I would just encourage you to zoom out and think about, if you have the time, maybe educate yourself a little bit about the history of the Asians in America and especially about Asian and Black solidarity, because it is very cliche, but in this case, a rising tide really does lift all boats. I don't know why you would be against a movement like Black Lives Matter, because Black Lives Matter is a movement dedicated to, uh, to fighting oppression and if you're against fighting oppression, then you're kind of against yourself because, you know, try as you might, you're, if you're not white, you're not white and you never will be. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, that is going to make itself apparent in your life in some way or another. Yeah. Thanks, Amelia. Adam. Yeah, Jim, I'll just say that um, my, one of my big takeaways over the last week plus of conversations in the organization and this one is uh, recognizing the the need to lean in um, and hear stories, but also a call earlier this week with members of my team pointed out to me that um, in talking with with several people of color, some of them want to tell their stories and share their experiences with me, and several of them are exhausted at telling their stories and feel we've talked about the story, the emotion, the feelings enough, and it's time for action. And, and so I, I have to appreciate that. Um, and respect that. And then as you, you've kind of emphasized me, Jim, then I need to take that back and take those stories and share them with other people that look like me so that we can talk about that to, to take some of that lift off of the people that have been telling their stories for decades, trying to make something happen. And I also have to be willing to lean into other people that look like me and hear their stories and where they're coming from when it comes to a conversation of diversity and inclusion and, and appreciate their experiences as well. Right. Well, thank you all. It was a wonderful conversation. Um, final acknowledgments, just a really great big thank you to the Center for Talent Innovation, both and for your participation in Emilia and Christina and being part of the conversation and um, for all of the help in helping make this session happen. And uh, so, and also to the panelists, Christina, Adam, Kevin, Emilia, em Emilia, thank you so much for being here and being part of this. And also to Claire for producing it and Isis and Gwendolyn for managing the question and answer part. Um, great work. And I would just finally to all of our, to everybody listening who's still out there is, um, you know, if you're a white colleague and you're listening to this, I would just ask you, if not now, then when do we start doing something about this? And if not now, then when and what is our next or first or, or the yeah, next or first action that we take to help make this happen? And to those of you that have been at this for a long time and hoping that we show up, thank you for continuing to hold the candle and do the work and hopefully we can do more of it together. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone.